animals including humans depend on the chemical senses to help identify nourishment like uh, the sweetness of honey or the aroma of pizza then uh, um, the chemical senses they also help identify nauseous substances such as the bitterness of uh, plant alkaloids or they also help identify the suitability of a mate chemical sensation is the oldest and most common of the sensory systems even brainless bacteria can detect and uh, tumble towards a favorable food source humans live in a sea of air full of volatile chemicals we put chemicals into our mouths for a variety of reasons and we carry a complex uh, sea within us in the form of blood and other fluids that bathe our cells we have uh, specialized detection systems for the chemicals in each environment the mechanisms of uh, chemical sensation that originally evolved to detect environmental substances now form the basis for chemical communication between cells and organs using hormones and neurotransmitters virtually every cell in every organism is responsive to many chemicals many types of uh, chemically sensitive cells means the chemoreceptors they are distributed throughout our body for example some nerve endings in skin and mucous membranes they warn us of uh, irritating chemicals a wide range of uh, chemoreceptors report subconsciously and consciously about our internal state nerve endings in the digestive organs detect uh, many types of uh, ingested substances receptors in arteries of the neck may have carbon dioxide and oxygen levels in our blood and uh, sensory endings in muscles they respond to acidity giving us the burning feeling that comes with the exertion and oxygen death gestation and uh, olfaction have a similar task means the detection of environmental chemicals in fact only by using both senses can be nervous system perceive flavor gustation and olfaction have uh, unusually strong and direct connections with our most basic internal needs including uh, thirst hunger emotion sex and certain forms of memory however the systems of uh, gustation and olfaction are separate and uh, different regarding the structures and uh, mechanisms of their chemoreceptors the gross organization of their central connections and their effects on behavior however today we will start uh, with these uh, chemical which are uh, olfaction that is the sense of uh, smell and uh, gustation uh, which is <clears throat> sense of taste but first let me ask an interesting question that uh, why your sense of smell is reduced when you have a 
cold. Even though the cold virus, it doesn't directly adversely affect the olfactory receptor cells. Well, you think over it and uh, the answer will come along as we move on with this lecture. But first, I give you a brief introduction to the chemical senses as uh, why they are termed so. The <clears throat> chemical senses, they provide a quality control checkpoint for the substances available for ingestion. These chemical senses, they are also classified as uh, visceral senses because of their um, close association with uh, gastrointestinal function, including the flow of uh, digestive juices and uh, their effect on our appetite. Well, as far as uh, the reception of these chemical senses is concerned, the receptors for both smell and taste, they are called uh, chemoreceptors because they generate the neural signals on binding with particular chemicals. Now the same receptors, they are also classified as uh, exteroceptors because the stimuli arrive from an external source and uh, stimulation of these receptors induces uh, pleasurable or objectionable sensations and uh, signals the presence of either something to seek which is a nutritionally useful and uh, good tasting food or they can signal the presence of something to avoid which is potentially toxic or a bad tasting substance. Now I tell you a few interesting bits about the uh, developmental aspect of our chemical senses. You see, uh, the sense of smell, it doesn't have a chance to develop until after birth. But by 10 days old, a baby can distinguish the scent of uh, his or her mother from another person. Similarly, the sense of taste also develops rapidly. Even uh, uh, two-week-old babies, they, they prefer sweet tastes over others. Since babies learn by putting things in their mouth, it is important to watch them closely for this reason. Enough with the introduction and uh, let's start with the uh, olfaction which uh, unfortunately is uh, poorly developed in humans. But still, human olfaction is uh, capable of uh, distinguishing between roughly 10,000 unique orders. Interestingly, sense of smell can trigger memory as the smell analyzing region of brain is closely connected to amygdala and hippocampus that handle memory and emotion. Now we can uh, categorize animals including human into three groups based on their olfactory powers. Animals with the greatly developed sense of smell, they are called macrosmatic. While uh, animals with the less developed senses, they are microsmatic. For example, humans and uh, monkeys. And then there are animals which have no sense of smell and they are called uh, anosmatic. Uh, many aquatic animals, they are the example of uh, anosmatic uh, animals. Now, as far as the importance of olfaction is uh, concerned, I myself am quite obsessed about it, but uh, for you ordinary beings, 
just know that uh, it is important for the enjoyment and selection of food. Moreover, the flavors which you so often crave, they are a combination of taste and smell. Where smell contributes about 80%. More crucial is that olfaction gives warning of harmful substances or places. It even becomes uh, life-saving in lower animals where smell also plays a major role not only in finding direction for seeking prey or avoiding predators but also forms a part of a sexual attraction to a mate. Keep in mind that uh, to be smelled a substance must be uh, sufficiently volatile for entry in nose with inspired air which means that it is uh, easily vaporized then it should be sufficiently water soluble to be dissolved in uh, mucus and uh, finally the substance ought to be at least slightly lipid soluble as lipid constituents of uh, psyllium itself they are a weak barrier to non-lipid soluble organs Now let's move on to the basic uh, structural functional unit of olfaction which is uh, its membrane or mucosa. You may find it interesting that the olfactory epithelium is one of the few regions of body where central nervous system nerves they directly interface with the external environment. The membrane is located in the upper part of the nasal cavity with an area of uh, around uh, Two and a half to three square centimeter, and it is uh, inhabited by three types of uh, cells. Uh, first, there are olfactory receptor cells, which are replaced every two months, and they also decline with age, which would uh, mean that approximately one percent of these sensory receptor cells they are not replaced each year. Next are the sporting cells which treat mucus and finally there are uh, basal cells which uh, serve as the precursors for new receptor cells and do not forget that mucus is present on top of our olfactory membrane. For the reception of odorants there are uh, olfactory receptor cells which are bipolar neurons derived from our central nervous system. Their number is about 100 million and they are of a thousand different types in each individual. Keep in mind that a given receptor can respond to a particular order component. Although there are millions of uh, olfactory sensory neurons, each expresses only one of 500 olfactory genes. Now the receptor cells are interspersed by much smaller number of uh, sustentacular cells. And then there are uh, basal cells along the basement membrane of the olfactory epithelium which regularly divide and yield differentiated cells that uh, replace lost neurons. You know, it's uh, very important to understand the working of uh, receptor cells. So let's dig a little deep for the olfactory receptor cell. You see, it's a bipolar neuron that have an average lifespan of uh, 48 days and then it is replaced. Apical surface of a receptor cell exhibits a knob that emits 4 to 25 olfactory hair or cilia. These cilia are non-myelinated with a length of uh, 2 micron and a diameter of only mm, 0.1 micron. 
cilia are important because they contain the receptors which provide binding sites and project into the mucus. Exons of the same olfactory receptor cells collectively form the olfactory nerve. So you see now uh, you can see that how important the reception is always and so are the receptor cells. Now what are these? These glands are spaced among the receptor cells to secrete mucus onto the epithelial surface of the olfactory membrane. So far I have uh, mentioned about the olfactory mucus a couple of times so why don't we just obtain a teeny tiny bit more of knowledge about it. This olfactory mucus contains uh, odorant binding proteins that help ferry the hydrophobic odorants to the olfactory receptors. Mucus also contains some proteins which increase the actions of uh, odoriferous substances on receptor cells and then it contains uh, lactoferrin, lysozyme and various immunoglobulins that help ensure that uh, pathogens do not gain access to central nervous system via the olfactory nerves. Next up uh, is the olfactory bulb. Here in this figure you can see the olfactory bulb and uh, this structure is magnified here. Uh, it's a neural structure of uh, forebrain which is involved in olfaction and uh, here you can see that it lies over the cribriform plate of uh, the ethmoid bone which uh, separates the cranial and the nasal cavities. Well, uh, you already know about the olfactory receptor cell. Now let's see how this uh, receptor protein plays its role in the working of receptor cell for olfaction. This protein is uh, located in the membrane of each olfactory cilium and each receptor protein is a long molecule which threads its way through the membrane about seven times, folding inward and outward. Now, among these folds, outside fold binds with the odorant, while the inside fold is coupled to a G protein. This G protein itself, it's a combination of three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. Now these uh, subunits they have their own importance which I will tell you shortly. Interestingly individual uh, olfactory neurons express a single receptor gene only because the number of the odorants that a person can distinguish exceeds a receptor gene number by several orders of magnitude. It means that the receptor must recognize specific chemical groups of multiple odorant molecules rather than uh, responding to just one odorant. Let's look at uh, how an olfactory cell is uh, excited. Look at this figure and uh, you can see that uh, first of all Odorant molecules diffuse into the mucus. Then they bind to the receptor protein that is linked to a cytoplasmic uh, G protein. And on binding uh, of the odorant, the alpha subunit of the G protein, it separates away. Now this uh, separated unit, it activates uh, the adenyl cyclase when it uh, binds here. 
and this results in the formation of uh, cyclic AMP. Now this cyclic AMP that is responsible for the opening of cation channels through which the sodium ions they diffuse inside the receptor cell and uh, depolarize the cell. So uh, this is how the receptor cell it is excited. Upon stimulation of the olfactory cells, the depolarization of uh, receptor cell leads to production of uh, action potential in the olfactory sensory fibers. A membrane potential of uh, an unstimulated olfactory cell is uh, minus 55 millivolt with baseline activity of action potentials once every 20 second to 2 to 3 per second. But the depolarization it brings the membrane potential to minus 30 millivolts with a frequency of 20 to 30 action potentials per second. So you can see that uh, this is how the olfactory transduction is achieved. As you can see in this uh, figure that uh, olfactory transduction process it can be summed up in uh, three steps. Uh, number one uh, the order and molecules they bind to the receptor and uh, activate the uh, G olfactory protein and uh, then uh, uh, next they the cyclic AMP it causes uh, calcium and uh, the sodium influx and uh, finally the uh, calcium ions they open a chloride channel and the olfactory uh, receptor neuron spikes resulting in depolarization. Now this uh, cascading effect which is seen in uh, the olfaction it basically is a pattern to uh, enhance the effect of a weak ordinate molecule and uh, now we will see that how is it uh, achieved. Actually what happens that a single dissolved molecule uh, it can activate uh, many receptor proteins and uh, activated G protein complex activates uh, multiple molecules of uh, adenylyl cyclase. Now each of these molecules causes uh, formation of uh, many times more molecules of uh, cyclic AMP and uh, each cyclic AMP opens still many times more sodium ion channels. So you can see that uh, this process multiplies the excitatory effect of uh, even the weakest order and uh, greatly enhances the sensitivity of uh, system to even a slightest stimulus. Although the determination of uh, differences in the intensity of any given order is poor in olfactory system, the intensity of initial olfactory stimulation is proportional to the logarithm of the stimulus strength. Now the concentration of an order it must be changed by 30% before a difference can be detected. Well, uh, you might have noticed that our olfactory sensations show rapid adaptation. To achieve this uh, rapidity, our uh, olfactory receptors adapt about 50% uh, during the first second, but uh, thereafter they adapt very little and very slowly. 
Now this uh, olfactory adaptation is mainly a central mechanism which is achieved through the adaptation of uh, receptors because the olfactory receptors they are phasic receptors and also through the psychological adaptation which uh, as a matter of fact is far greater than the receptors adaptation but don't forget that additional adaptation also occurs within central nervous system now let's see how this uh, olfactory adaptation is uh, centrally regulated neural mechanism for adaptation involves uh, centrifugal fibers from brain backward to the uh, granule cells now keep in mind that these granule cells they are the inhibitory cells in the olfactory bulb so this feedback inhibition suppresses the relay of the smell signals providing adaptation and uh, you can also infer now that uh, it's not a physiological process which takes place at the level of receptors but rather it's a it's a mechanism which alters perception primary olfactory uh, sensations are as many as 100 but they have been uh, narrowed down to 7 which are uh, camphoraceous musky floral peppermint ethereal pungent and uh, putrid olfactory uh, thresholds are the lowest concentrations of uh, a chemical that can be detected we all discussed that even a minute quantity of uh, stimulating agent in the air it can elicit a smell sensation for example uh, there is a chemical methyl mercaptan which can be smelled even when 125 trillionth of a gram is present in each ml of air now uh, here you can see the olfactory thresholds of uh, some common orders And uh, here are some other examples of uh, uh, the substances which may be detected at uh, very low concentrations. But uh, beware because there are some toxic substances which are orderless. It means they have uh, uh, order detection threshold higher than their lethal concentration one such example is uh, carbon dioxide which is uh, detected at uh, 74,000 but the lethal limit is already reached at 50,000 well uh, that sounds quite dangerous I must say now if I want to sum the whole debate so far, I can say that uh, smell sensation either could be pleasant or unpleasant and uh, threshold of uh, some ordered molecule is extremely low. Uh, for example, 125 billionth of a milligram, but the range of sensitivity is uh, only 10 to 50 times now i don't want to skip an important thing as uh, organ binding proteins you see our olfactory epithelium contains one or more organ binding proteins which are produced by sporing cells and then they are released in the extracellular space now these uh, uh, organ binding proteins they have uh, certain functions these proteins uh, may concentrate the organs and transfer them to receptors and they may also partition hydrophobic ligands from air to an aqueous phase 
and then they sequester the audience away from side of the order recognition to allow for order clearance. Now we jump to the olfactory pathway which is uh, responsible for the transmission of uh, signals into the central nervous system. The olfactory fibers which are exons of uh, receptor cells collect into bundles of uh, 20 or more and uh, then they pass through the perforations in the cribriform plate of ethmoid and finally enter the olfactory bulb. You see olfactory bulb is a complex neural structure containing several different layers of cells and uh, each olfactory bulb is lined by small ball-like neural junctions which are called glomeruli. So we can say that uh, fibers terminate in relation to glomeruli. Olfactory glomerulus actually forms the first relay station. This is a tangled knot of uh, mitral and uh, tufted cell dendrites and uh, olfactory nerve fibers. Now each of the glomeruli receive synaptic input from only one type of olfactory receptor which in turn responds to only one discrete component of an order. Then the glomeruli sort and uh, file various components of uh, odoriferous molecules before relaying signals to the higher levels. Keep in mind that the mitral cells in uh, glomeruli, they refine the smell signals. Now these uh, olfactory glomeruli, they also have some other functions. For example, they, uh, they demonstrate lateral inhibition which uh, sharpens and focuses the olfactory signals and uh, this mechanism is mediated by periglomerular cells and granule cells. Moreover, um, extracellular field potential in each glomerulus oscillates and helps to focus the signals reaching the cortex, while the granule cells, they regulate the frequency of oscillation. Then comes the olfactory tract which is formed by the axons of uh, mitral and tufted cells. It leaves the olfactory bulb after receiving signals and enter specialized regions of the cortex. Here uh, you can see that both olfactory tract and bulb, they are an uh, anterior outgrowth of brain tissue from the base of the brain. Hmm. A unique feature of our olfactory tract is that the tract does not first pass through the thalamus before reaching cortex. While uh, all neuronal communication involving sight, hearing, taste and touch, they make a mandatory stopover at the brain's relay station, the thalamus. Uh, it means there are no direct flights between the sense and the cortex except for smell. The cortical areas of olfaction are medial and uh, lateral. Medial olfactory area exerts uh, primitive behavioral aspects of olfactory signals. For example, licking, salivation, and uh, other feeding responses caused by smell of food or by emotional drive associated with smell. And this area is uh, represented by septal nuclei. Now signals from this area, they project to hypothalamus and uh, other regions for controlling the same aspects of olfaction. 
Well, the lateral olfactory area is uh, concerned with the specific behavioral responses related to odors, such as uh, a learned control of uh, food intake. One example of the affective domain of this area is uh, the aversion to food that has caused nausea and vomiting in the past. Now, uh, the lateral area itself is uh, composed of uh, pre-piriform area, piriform area and also cortical amygdaloid region. From uh, <clears throat> these areas, these signals, they are uh, directed to less primitive limbic structures, for example, hippocampus. And when we continue with the, uh, the olfactory pathway, uh, main olfactory destinations, they are uh, primary olfactory cortex, including the piriform cortex. And then there is uh, amygdala and uh, the entorhinal cortex. Uh, in us humans, signals from uh, primary cortical olfactory area, they are projected also to the dorsomedial thalamic nucleus and then to the orbitofrontal cortex. This route is uh, phylogenetically a newer pathway and it is involved in uh, conscious perception, also in the analysis of order and at the same time also in uh, order discrimination. Now the question is that how different orders are discriminated from one another but this matter is uh, exactly not resolved although there is a theory that uh, receptors are selectively sensitive. For example, if uh, two orders are mixed, the uh, resulting intensity is always less than the sum. And Perceived intensity is dominated by stronger component due to the receptor action. Um, then there is a direction from which an order comes, uh, which may be indicated by slight difference in the time of arrival of order molecules in the two nostrils, just like we did it with sound. Let me know if you guys are familiar with the term of pheromones, which I'm pretty sure you are. You see, the pheromones are non-volatile, orderless chemical signals which are passed subconsciously from one individual to another. And uh, then there is a gomeronasal organ. Uh, which is abbreviated as VNO. It's an uh, accessory olfactory organ found in uh, many animals including mammals. It is located half an inch inside the nose next to the vomer bone. Now you must be wondering that uh, what's the connection of pheromones with uh, VNO? Well, I will uh, enlighten you by telling you that uh, the other name of these famous pheromones is uh, vomeroferens. In humans, uh, vomeronasal organ was uh, considered as uh, vestigial or non-functional. But recently, it is found that this organ is present in the form of uh, vomeronasal pits on uh, anterior part of nasal septum and uh, receptor of uh, these uh, pits they detect odorless human pheromones even at a very low concentration in air and uh, why this organ is also called Jacobson's organ of course because this was discovered by Ludwig Jacobson in 1813 now, 
tell me that uh, do we have a sixth sense of you a common sense well let's discuss you see that uh, binding of a pheromone to its receptor on uh, the surface of the neuron in VNO that triggers an action potential and this action potential travels through non olfactory pathways to the limbic system and hence it governs the emotional response it is interesting to note that the messages which are conveyed by VNO they bypass the cortical consciousness so this uh, subconscious detection of uh, odorless chemical messengers in the air that is considered uh, as an extra sense for humans now we will look at the uh, abnormalities of uh, uh, olfactory system the first one is uh, anosmia which is a total loss of uh, all the orders now anosmia could be temporary or permanent uh, the temporary anosmia is usually due to obstruction of nose which uh, occurs during common colds nasal sinusitis and even in uh, allergic conditions while the permanent anosmia it could occur during lesions in uh, olfactory tract uh, or meningitis and uh, also in some neurodegenerative conditions such as uh, parkinson's disease and uh, alzheimers uh moreover uh, anosmia may often follow head trauma as a result of damage to the olfactory cortex or due to the shearing of the olfactory nerves as they pass the cribriform plate now uh, anosmia is an abnormality with uh, a number of uh, disadvantages for example uh person would be unable to experience enjoyment of pleasant aromas and uh, also a full spectrum of tastes which would uh, suppress the appetite and it could cause uh, weight loss depression and uh, withdrawal from social events that involve food but the more alarming disadvantage is that the individual is at greater risk because they are not able to detect order from dangers such as gas leak or fire not to mention spoiled food then other two abnormalities are uh, hypoosmia and hyperosmia hypoosmia is the reduced ability to recognize and to detect any order in this condition uh, the orders can only be detected at uh, <clears throat> higher concentrations now again hypoosmia it may be temporary or permanent and uh, it could occur due to the same causes of anosmia it is uh, the most common disorder of smell during aging and uh, even as a result of upper respiratory tract infection now uh, hyperosmia is the exaggerated sensation and it is also called uh, olfactory hyperesthesia interestingly it is only a perceptual disorder but it may occur in uh, brain injury uh, even in uh, epilepsy and uh, some Uh, neurotic conditions also since we are discussing uh, olfactory abnormalities so uh, let's talk about the weird ones also this phantosmia is just an olfactory hallucination it means smelling something that's not there now the disorder could be central or peripheral phantom smells or you can say imaginary odors 
they are not uncommon and brief episodes of phantosmia can also be triggered by temporal lobe seizures epilepsy head trauma or even at the onset of a migraine Now pardon me, I am not comparing you with this superb animal, but do you ever wonder that uh, why do we sniff to smell something better? Because it increases our ability to smell by enhancing the detection of odorous molecules in the air. Not only this, but uh, sniffing also causes a peripheral drive in brain to synchronize the rhythmic activity which is the concurrent firing of neurons in the olfactory bulb with the breathing 